Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am so glad that you are able to join us this evening for another installment of our winter session of Beyond the Walls, a partnership between the Oshawa Public Libraries and the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities at Ontario Tech University. I would like to start our evening together tonight with a land acknowledgement. We are thankful to be welcome on these lands in friendship. The lands we are situated on are covered by the Williams Treaties and are the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a branch of the Greater Anishinaabe Nation, including Algonquin, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. These lands remain home to many Indigenous nations and peoples. We acknowledge this land out of respect for the Indigenous nations who have cared for Turtle Island, also called North America, from before the arrival of settler peoples until this day. Most importantly, we acknowledge that the history of these lands has been tainted by poor treatment and a lack of friendship with the First Nations who call them home. This history is something we are all affected by because we are all treaty people in Canada. We all have a shared history to reflect on and each of us is affected by this history in different ways. Our past defines our present, but if we move forward as friends and allies, then it does not have to define our future. Our practice in these events is to turn our attention to our guest speaker who will speak for 20 to 30 minutes. And so during that time, we would appreciate it if everyone could please keep themselves on mute. We follow this with the remainder of the time dedicated to your questions in our discussion. And you are welcome to unmute yourself to participate or you can put your question and comments into the chat. And now I am so delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Thomas McMorrow from Ontario Tech University's Legal Studies Program, who is here to walk us through defining the constitutional limits to governing badly. Great, thank you so much, Andrea, for that uh, great introduction and very fine land acknowledgement. I wanna thank also uh, Karen Crawley and Jennifer Gardner and Jennifer Clark uh, for their help in putting this all together. Uh, I'm really excited to be participating in this event. Uh, the Beyond the Wall series has been excellent and uh, I know has been a, a great source of, of insight uh, and inspiration, uh, and even a certain degree of remote companionship during these difficult COVID times. Um, so, uh, you know, there's certainly always opportunity for an off night. And uh, anyway, I'm glad that you guys are bearing with me here this evening. Um, I'm, uh, as my, as the title of my presentation uh, states, the topic is defining the constitutional limits to governing badly. Um, and I'm going to be talking about that notion in relation to a current case that is coming before the Supreme Court of Canada next month. And that's the case of the City of Toronto and the Attorney General of Ontario. And it concerns a constitutional challenge to a law that was passed um, in 2018. And that law changed the ward boundaries. Uh, in the midst of the Toronto municipal election. And so instead of 47 wards, uh, it was cut nearly in half. And that left uh, candidates scrambling because now they, they weren't uh, running in the same wards. It confused voters. It certainly uh, made things difficult for the uh, city of Toronto clerk uh, who had the unenviable task of, of trying to uh, switch the uh, electoral uh, format uh, halfway through uh, the process. But in so far as this case will give us uh, a glimpse at the way in which courts uh, in the past and, and, and the way in which the courts as this case has been making its way up to the Supreme Court have dealt with the question of, well, what are the limits to governing badly? When is an unfair law unconstitutional? I'll be looking at those questions, but really fundamentally what I'm interested in is not just the constitutional limits to governing badly, but the constitutional limits to governing well. And I think that that really is the most important question uh, 
And what I'm going to try and do in the course of this talk is, is give you an overview of that case and the arguments for and against the unconstitutionality of the Better Local Government Act. But I also then want to consider this question of the legalization of politics. What happens when we treat political questions as questions of constitutional rights, not ones that our democratic representatives uh, grapple with, but ones that we expect courts to decide on our behalf. So I, I'm gonna express a, a note of caution about expecting too much uh, from the Supreme Court in this case. And I wanna draw attention to the fact that the, the challenges of governance and the political problems that we face in this province are, are a lot greater and, and more complex uh, than would necessarily be captured in the terms of, of this particular case or indeed solved by any remedy the Supreme Court of Canada could supply in its decision on this case. And instead, I think that what we need to do is to think about the Constitution more broadly, not just something that is defined by written text, but nor something that is simply defined by court decisions, that it's a, really a responsibility on behalf of, of all Canadians, and in this instance, all Ontarians, to expect of their government uh, a, a certain level of, of performance, of commitment, and, and of principle. So um, I'll, I'll return to that uh, as I go through. But what I'd like to start with right now is just by giving some, some background to the, the Better Local Government Act. So as I mentioned, uh, it was in 2018, uh, not long after the Ford government came into power, if you recall, they were elected in June of that year. And by August, they had passed this law that to the surprise of a great many people, especially uh, candidates in the municipal election uh, that year, which would cut the number of wards effectively in half. And, and this was particularly surprising, well, for a few reasons. Obviously, the timing of it. Right, so so the 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 writ had been dropped a couple months into the campaign, and all of a sudden, uh, the ward boundaries were were being redrawn, and so what that meant was that you know candidates who had been knocking door to door uh, at the homes of constituents found out that actually those people weren't eligible to vote for them at all because the boundaries on the map had been redrawn. So this idea that uh, the political message they've been trying to communicate uh, had actually been been wasted and uh, concerned too that the um, that the, the, the electors uh, wouldn't know for whom they should vote or or, or how exactly to most effectively uh, exercise their, their franchise. There was also a concern that the particular wards that the government had had imposed were now were now larger. And so what the government did uh, the government of Ontario was they brought the the wards to be on parity with the um, provincial and, and, and federal uh, electoral districts. But the effect of this, of course, was that now you would have a municipal councillor for each ward representing a much larger uh, number of people. And so there were understandably a number of, of objections to the to the timing uh, of this law uh, and what it was what it was doing. Uh, and it was challenged by the city and challenged by candidates in the courts. And they said, this is unconstitutional. And in their argument that it was unconstitutional, they invoked the unwritten constitutional principle of democracy. So in the, the late 1990s, actually in a, a case, uh, a, a reference case by the Supreme Court of Canada uh, regarding basically the constitutional rules of, of Quebec secession, the court, uh, in 1998 talked about how there are a number of unwritten constitutional principles that are the very lifeblood of the Constitution. So even though they're not spelled out in the Charter, uh, they're not laid out in the Constitution Act or, or originally in the, the British North America Act of 1867, which allocates powers between federal and provincial levels of government, but these, these principles are, are fundamental. And the court said, on the basis of these, of these principles, we can say that Yes, the government of Canada needs to pay attention uh, and needs to uh, uh, negotiate if Quebec uh, has a, a referendum in favor of, of separation. But likewise, Quebec can't just unilaterally separate. They need to negotiate with the government and there needs to be some kind of political way uh, to work out the new constitutional arrangement, even if that includes secession. 
So it was an extraordinary situation because it was this hypothetical case that the Supreme Court was being presented with. And in it, they elaborated these unwritten constitutional principles. Um, but also they said that these constitutional principles uh, can be invoked to constrain government action. And so part of what the, uh, what, part of what the city of Toronto uh, argued uh, was that in this instance, this, this undermining of the electoral process by changing the rules halfway through the campaign was an attack on this unwritten uh, uh, constitutional principle of, of democracy. At the same time, they argued that it was a infringement of the Section 2B under the Charter, uh, freedom of expression rights of the candidates and the electors. And so it may seem uh, perhaps a bit counterintuitive that this would be a case uh, involving freedom of expression. Um, because if anything, you might say, well, wouldn't it have to do with uh, the right to vote? Uh, which is protected under Section 3 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Section 3 refers explicitly to provincial and federal elections. It doesn't mention municipal elections. And what's more, municipalities are not recognized as a constitutional order of government. So going back to that British North America Act, that imperial British statute, which established the Dominion of Canada in 1867, it allocates powers to uh, the federal parliament and provincial, provincial parliaments, um, provincial legislatures, but it, it, it says that municipalities or cities are under the authority of, of provinces. So all that is to say, when this case came before uh, the Superior Court of Ontario, uh, Mr. Justice Bellababa said, this is an infringement of the freedom of expression of these candidates and of the electors. And the governments provided no good reason why they would infringe on their rights in this case. And so because of that, they don't you know, satisfy this, this threshold which governments have for infringing rights, which is that the, the infringement be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So Justice Bellababa said, you know, hold the press, the election is gonna proceed according to the old ward structure um, and when he, when he handed down that decision, uh, Premier Ford reacted very strongly uh, and, and said, well, we're going to invoke the notwithstanding clause. So another kind of piece of, of Canadian constitutional trivia, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but under section 33, there is a possibility for legislatures to basically uh, in, invoke uh, a... Uh, a rule that says that the legislation they're passing uh, will not be invalidated by courts for violating certain rights under the charter. And this was a, a clause that was included uh, in the Constitution Act in 1982 because it was felt that, well, if we, um, you know, if we, if we establish a charter of rights and we give courts this kind of power to invalidate legislation, then we might undermine our existing democratic institutions. So we'll create the section 32, 33, the notwithstanding clause, so governments can pass laws notwithstanding the fact that they infringe on charter rights, and, and that will, will ensure a bit more balance in the constitutional system. Now, no Ontario Premier had ever invoked the notwithstanding clause, and indeed, in the end, Premier Ford and the, the uh, provincial uh, government of Ontario did not end up invoking the notwithstanding clause e either, but, but he threatened to do so. And uh, instead, what they did was they appealed the decision um, and you know, time was of the essence because the election was, was coming up and the uh, Ontario Court of Appeal basically said, well, we'll have to determine this on the merits at a later date, but in the meantime, we don't think there's a strong enough case here for the city of Toronto, and so we're going to we're going to reverse that decision of the Superior Court, and the uh, election is going to go ahead with this new ward structure. And so it did in 2018, fall of 2018. Uh, Toronto City Council uh, comprised uh, 25 instead of uh, 47 wards, um, and uh, uh, the the next year the Ontario Court of Appeal. Uh, laid down its, its decision, uh, confirming its uh, original ruling. Uh, but in this case, there were three members of the court who said that the law was 
constitutional and two members who said it wasn't. And those two members of the court who said it wasn't um, picked up on where uh, Justice Bellababa had argued that it was an unjustifiable uh, infringement of the freedom of expression um, of, the, uh, of the parties. Now, as much as, uh, as you know, one may think that the Better Local Government Act uh, is, a, is a misnomer, um, there's also a, a, a case to be made why uh, it is nevertheless uh, constitutional. So on the one hand, the, the, the sense of injustice and unfairness that, that people felt when this law was passed was that local democracy should be respected. And so uh, there just seemed to be something deeply unseemly, indeed, to the Toronto argued unconstitutional about disrupting an election, about interfering with the, the electoral process. And there's a sense as well that, okay, yeah, maybe the British North America Act in 1867 didn't allocate lawmaking power to municipalities. And maybe the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982 under section three didn't explicitly acknowledge the right to vote of, uh, you know, as it pertains to municipalities, it only mentioned it in terms of, of the parliament and provincial legislatures. We know that, you know, over the last 150 years, and certainly even under the last 40 years, that municipalities, especially big municipalities like Toronto, play an incredibly important role in people's lives. They, they may formally be creatures of provincial statute, but they're lawmakers in their own right. Uh, they collect taxes and they uh, develop policies and provide services that uh, are, are a huge way, that have a huge impact on, on people's day-to-day -day experiences. And so to, to treat the uh, capacity to, to participate in these forms of local democracy as, as just something that can be uh, added or taken away at whim, understandably uh, upsets people and, 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 and understandably gives rise to a sense that, that surely even if there isn't a a formal rule against this, that the unwritten principles of the constitution, for example, these commitments to democracy and the rule of law ought to prevent the provincial government from, from proceeding uh, in, this, in this way. Um, but there's a challenge, right? Because if you think about the uh, Supreme Court accepting that argument, then effectively in invalidating this law, they would declare municipalities a third order of government. And what would that mean? And how can a case that involves the city of Toronto give rise to a decision that would potentially affect a whole number of municipalities uh, across the province? Very different in size, very different in scope, not to mention the rest of the country. And what would the knock-on ramifications, the political effects of that kind of uh, recognition uh, be? What, for example, would happen if, if Montreal were regarded uh, as a municipality with its own constitutional authority? What would its relationship to the province of Quebec be as a result? And what would it mean for national politics if Montreal weren't part of Quebec in the same way uh, it is right now? Montreal being, of course, uh, the, the place in Quebec with the highest number of Anglophones, the highest number uh, the highest rate of, of, of social and religious diversity uh, in that province. So there's a number of, of complex questions, a whole number of parties whom this decision would affect who don't get to have their say, who don't get to have their day in court. And so there's a question about whether, okay, yes, maybe Canada's constitutional order insofar as the rights of municipalities and authority of municipalities go is outmoded. But are the courts and is constitutional adjudication the best way to remedy the problem. And I think that we need to be mindful, right, about thinking that courts can provide the answer here. Um, because there's a danger of what I mentioned at the beginning of, of my presentation about the, the legalization of politics. And that's where we convert political questions, questions of how do we govern our lives together as, as legal issues, which courts are best suited to, to addressing. And, uh, and solve it. And th there can be something very disempowering about this, right? Because if you don't have the expertise or the credentials or the money or the influence uh, to partake in the litigation process. In other words, if you're, if you're not a judge and you're not a lawyer and you don't have the money to hire one, 
then what are the opportunities for political engagement that you have if politics is reduced to the judicial process and to litigation before the Supreme Court of Canada? There's another problem too, is that if within our, our political vocabulary, our focus is strictly on rights, then we may not accurately describe and name the way in which government is failing us. So as I mentioned, we can appreciate why a disruption to the electoral process uh, signifies an undermining of democracy. It's certainly, certainly disrespectful to local democracy, but is it automatically a, an infringement of the freedom of expression? So what happens when we, we think about a disruption to a political system to local democracy, strictly in terms of the individual rights of, uh, of voters or the individual rights of, of those who are seeking to, to represent them. We, we necessarily kind of miss the bigger picture and we have less of an appreciation of the complexity and indeed the scale of the problem with uh, acting in a way that's so disrespectful of, uh, of the democratic system and of the electoral uh, process. And so, the other way in which I think it's problematic to, um, to be preoccupied or, or to focus ex solely on, on, on rights is that when we look at the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it protects civil and political rights. And that's how the courts have interpreted it. So in, in other words, social and economic rights, which are fundamental to a person's existence, are nevertheless not deemed of constitutionally enforceable status within our system. So to the extent that we see everything uh, that matters to us in a constitutional sense, just through the lens of the charter and just through the lens of, of court adjudication, it means that we're already ignoring things that can't be framed strictly in terms of, of civil and political rights. And so we need to remember also that courts are necessarily reactive in their design, right? They're, they're, they're there to adjudicate, they're not there to formulate policies. They're not there to develop or administer programs. If, if you like, in a way, they're, they're, um, they're like health inspectors, right? Who are, who are making sure that the food has gotten onto your table in a particular way, but they're not cooks and they're not farmers and they don't get to uh, you know, have a say in, in whether you, you have enough to eat or not, or at least they haven't taken on that role in our society. So understanding the limitations of courts is, is really important, lest we start to conflate the constitutional standards they set, the minimums that they, they set as, as somehow adequate to having a, a, a healthy, just and fair uh, political system and political life, right? So what is the Supreme Court of Canada doing to stop rising sea levels? What is the Supreme Court of Canada doing in order to ensure that kids who have fallen behind during the last you know, wave of, of lockdowns uh, being out of school will have a chance to catch up on their learning? What is the Supreme Court doing to ensure that uh, elders in long-term care facility are protected uh, from the COVID virus and, and also have the, the supports they need? It's it, and I'm not I'm not saying that you know oh gosh look how look how bad the court is because it's not doing all those things I'm just using those examples to show that of course there's limitations to what we can expect from courts there's a reason why we have two other branches of government like my grandmother used to say there's a reason why you have two ears and one mouth there's a reason why we have two other branches of government the executive and the legislature precisely in order to uh, perform these these lawmaking and administrative tasks that that courts are not designed nor operated uh, to, to perform. Um, and I think that, you know, there's, there's two things which, um, which are, are, are worth paying, paying attention to here. So, so the, uh, the rise of right-wing politics globally has given rise to this sense of, okay, well, we need to stop politicians run amok. Uh, we, there, there needs to be a way for courts to stop politicians who seem not to have respect for the unwritten norms of a constitutional liberal democracy. Um, and so it's quite, it's quite understandable in, in, a, in an era where confidence 
and trust in politicians appears to be low. Indeed, perhaps even confidence in the electorate is low to hope that, that courts will, will be there to, to bail us out, to, to ensure that certain core principles are, are respected and defended. Um, but another feature of our times right now, which is the, 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 the pandemic, brings something else into relief, right? So in political discourse, we, we often hear public administration denigrated, right? We, we hear negative things uh, about, uh, about bureaucrats and, and, and public servants, um, and that can sometimes just actually be from from people we know who, who actually work at Service Canada or public servants themselves. No. Um, but the, we certainly, you know, do not have a, a kind of political discourse that that generally, um, you know, extols the the virtues of government bureaucracy. And yet, during the pandemic, especially, it's really brought to the fore how the value of the efficacy and accountability of the public service is so obviously essential, right? So whether we're talking public health officials, election return officers, special investigative unit investigators, or hospital custodians, all of these people were paid by government, need to have decent, need, need to be decent, need to be hardworking, need to be trained, and need to be fairly compensated because our system, based on the rule of law and the promises that we hope government can fulfill to Canadians, depend on people doing their jobs and, and doing them well. Um, and so, you know, whether we're talking about short term measures like like lockdowns or behind the scenes ongoing processes like planning and budgeting for local public health authorities, we see that that these these aspects of administration, these, uh, you know, perhaps more mundane features of lawmaking are, are indeed matters of, of, of life and death. And so as important as the courts are. Uh, and as important as it is to enforce constitutional constitutional rules, it's important to recognize also that that they're intrinsically limited in their capacity to ensure not just that we avoid the worst pathologies of bad governance, but that we're able to uh, achieve the kind of level of good governance we need to address all of these complex issues that we that we face, pandemic or not. Um, and so. What I will kind of end with here is just to, to think about the fundamental constitutional challenge as not just one of being how to curtail abuses of power, right? How to play, how to place checks on the power of the legislature to pass laws. Because we have to think that, well, in order to meet these persistent and complex governance challenges, those the the, the provincial legislatures and parliaments also need to be able to have power, right? And so uh, we, we need to be we need to be mindful of of, of how uh, the uh, you know the the desire to, um, to 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 see someone have their have their reckoning with with consequences we think that they should have paid more attention to uh, may in the end uh, you know do more harm to the institutions that exist in this in this fine balance and that and that ultimately uh, the genuine accountability that politicians need to have in order to ensure that they're discharging their, their duties in an effective way can't just be uh, to courts and, and, and can't just be out of fear that, that four years or three years down the road after they've, they've passed a law that there could be a, a hearing before the Supreme Court and a whole other year perhaps after that, uh, before that initial legislation is invalidated. So, um, you know, I, I, I I, I sympathize indeed with those who are challenging the Better Local Government Act. On the other hand, I think that perhaps, you know, they can be heartened that if they do indeed uh, lose uh, before the Supreme Court of Canada in this appeal, that perhaps that will provide the, the level of, of motivation that, uh, that Ontarians and, and perhaps others uh, throughout the country will need in order to pursue through constitutional politics the kind of renovation of Canada's formal constitutional order that can uh, you know, ensure that these forms of local de democracy uh, get the uh, respect that, that, they, that they deserve. So I will, uh, I will conclude there and uh, I look forward to, uh, to, your, uh, to your questions. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Tom. That was fascinating. Um, I would love to turn the floor over to, to those of you joining us so we can pick Tom's brain and learn some more. I have a quick question. Um, Tom, thank you very much for that really rich discussion. And I, my question is not going to do it justice. But I, I was really interested in the way you talked about limitations, uh, the limitations of the approach that this particular case is, is compelled to make because of the system that we work in. I'm particularly interested in what you had to say about how a singular focus on rights leads to a kind of myopia about the political shortcomings of our constitutional system. And then complementary to that, you talked about limitations of the courts. And I thought the metaphor of a health inspector was just beautiful. It really revealed uh, the, it, it really, lays bare the way in which we can't expect courts to be policymakers, although sometimes critiques of court, uh, the court's activism, as it's often described uh, from, from some parts of the political spe the spectrum. There's a story about courts, how they can be activist that suggests that they are policymakers. But in fact, I think that the discussion that you just gave us talks about the way, helps us to, helps us to understand how that's not possible. Courts really are just applying the regulations. And I'd like to invite you to say a little bit more about the way in which you think that those political shortcomings might be remedied. Okay, well, I, I, I'm glad I arranged uh, Natalie to send me, to lob me a few of these uh, slow pitches, um, uh, these, uh, you know, easy questions. Um, but uh, well, first of all, I, I think you know, thinking about about rights, um, and in fact, thinking about rights or thinking about the relationship between courts and, and legislatures, I, I I will confess that there's a danger to making wide generalizations, right? Like the I I don't think that there um, is any necessarily ideal institutional arrangement or even ideal concept in in law. Um, you know, there's a, a, a tremendous amount of contingency to all of these things, right? And and uh, and to to um, uh, to lament or criticize uh, the way in which rights discourse can impoverish our lives. All you need to do is look at the experiences of people who uh, who fought for their rights, and were it not for you know constitutional courts recognizing. Uh, their their right, whether as as women or or whether as as um, you know racialized minorities or or any number of of people in our society who who um, who have felt that uh, that they've really had to fight for the right. So I'm I'm very cognizant of that. And I what I'm what I'm saying though is that um, is that that's just one concept, and that's just one word within this larger legal vocabulary. And it can be helpful and it can, it can draw our attention to questions of, of injustice that we might otherwise overlook. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, part of the job of being a lawyer is being able to deploy that language of rights to, to show how an issue uh, actually affects somebody's rights. But it also means that you, know, you can do that in any number of cases. In fact, I would say, Every example of of a, of a political decision or a managerial move that you've experienced, even just in your place of work or 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 an unfair experience you've had in a classroom, you can reformulate that as a question of rights. You know, and 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 we see that in this case where where the disruption of the uh, municipal election is reframed as an infringement on the rights of candidates. And I just don't think that that is the most accurate account of the injustice that's transpired here. And I don't think that in responding, like the vindication of candidates to have not had to knock on too many doors uh, without having those people, you know, able to vote for them, just doesn't do justice to um, to 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 what's problematic with uh, with disrupting uh, an, an election in, in that way. 
Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the fact is the, um, the, you know, part of, part of the concern is that, well, by stripping the number of wards, by cutting them in half, it means that there's fewer opportunities for candidates to run. And so what happens? Well, it tends to be that then the, the incumbents win. And if you look at the composition of the Toronto you know, Municipal Council, it's not at all reflective of the diversity of the city of Toronto. And all of, you know, the more competition for, for fewer seats isn't, isn't going to, to, to change that. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can necessarily uh, highlight all those problems by explaining them in terms of one individual's right to be a municipal councillor, because nobody does have a right to be municipal councillor. And I think that to the, you know, one of the, one of the arguments that, um, that those who are, are critical of the law and who say it's unconscionable give is like, well, if there's no limits, does that mean that the government could then uh, pass a law that says that the day after the election, um, it's not the uh, the elected mayor who, in fact, becomes mayor, but but somebody of the of the premier's own personal choosing, you know? And and I think that yeah, in that case, that sh would be <laughs> alarming. And maybe that's a case where then the courts would say, look, this is highly unusual and it's an extraordinary circumstance, but we're going to need to interfere here. The thing is that I don't think that a government acting in a way, even that's obtuse, is, is all that extraordinary. Or at least I think that we it would be extraordinary for us to expect the courts to demand an ordinary level of competence and accountability and uh, wise decision-making by our elected officials. And so I think that when I'm talking about the, the needing to recognize the limitations of courts, it's, it's to see that you know, there, uh, you know, the, the metaphor, I mean, the metaphor of trees is, is used so often, but what one of, I think the, uh, you know, if we, if we think about how the branches on a tree, they, they are connected, right? And that the, uh, the sign that one of the branches is withering could very well be a sign that the, the, the rest of the tree is unhealthy. And I think that what, what happens sometimes due to the best of intentions is that too much weight is placed on the judicial branch. When, when really it can't perform this kind of more um, review type role if people aren't doing the, the, the right things in the first place, you know? And we think about all the different encounters we have with governments, whether that's on a municipal level or whether that's provincial or, or federal. And you need good people in those jobs and you need people who have a sense of responsibility and commitment to principle uh, that, and, and to what we're doing as a society that doesn't depend on a, on a court correcting them if they mess up. And so in thinking about, you know, when I said I want to get from thinking about defining the limits to governing badly, the constitutional limits to governing badly, is thinking about what are the constitutional conditions to governing well? And I think part of that is seeing the way that beyond the, the court's role in enforcing a legal constitution is we need to renew, renew the public's role and the role of our elected representatives in a political constitution. Thanks, Tom. Hannah, you are up next, please. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so a lot of this conversation kind of went, it was challenging for me. Um, because I was trying to wrap my head around the idea that, you know, so why, why should I be concerned about this if, say, in Oshawa, where we are now, they just sort of rearrange the, the, you know, the next government comes in and they want to put it in their favor so they know if they rearrange things again. They've got precedent already set in Toronto. And as you said, municipalities aren't enough really controlled by this. And then I was thinking about the idea of the, the, like the food inspector, right? Or the health inspector. I was sort of thinking about when you started talking about the health inspector is that each one of those ward people, the people who run those wards now, there's half of half as many of them, each of those were health inspectors rather than the court being the health inspector. And what happens when you cut the half number of health inspectors for a city in half, right? Um, it becomes more challenging to do the job. Is there a possibility that um, the courts could sort of acknowledge that there's, that the democracy as it, as it had been shaped and, and cut in half, couldn't actually 
address the concerns of its community? Is that, I'm not sure if I'm making any sense there, but it, it seems to me that coming in and just sweeping the board and cutting uh, the number of people who could be eligible to vote, I don't know if it's unconstitutional or not, mm -hmm. um, but there are certain people who do have rights within that family of people in Toronto who may not actually have the ability now because they can't access the people they need to make those challenges, even as a form of activism to the court and say, hey, you know, I'm gonna challenge the court and I'm gonna bring the court along with me and I'm gonna force it to make a decision in here in the form of activism. I'd be the activist in that case, but I'd be using the court as a tool, so. Yeah. Well, that makes any sense. Yeah, no, that's a great that's question, awesome. Hannah. And I, you know, the, uh, I think what you, you know, the, uh, the whole notion of local democracy is predicated on the idea of having having some connection to the people who represent us, and and presumably, yeah, if if, if Parliament only consisted of, of of ten people representing the entire country, we'd say, well, that's by definition less democratic than you know the the current number of of, of seats. And um, at the same time, though, that particular argument hasn't had traction with the courts in the past. So you know, they'll say. In, in Vancouver, for example, the city council is way smaller than the one in Toronto. And I say that there is no kind of absolute guarantee of, of a certain level of, um, uh, of representation. Um, but, uh, but I mean, that, that's definitely an argument that I think we'll, we'll hear coming forward in, in some way, uh, probably in that, in that appeal um, next month. Um, but I think it's also, a, a good illustration of, of how um, you know the, 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 there's the there's the constitutional question or what you know how can you based on the text of the constitution based on precedent set in past cases argue that a government didn't have the authority to make a decision but then there's also the question of whether a government's making a good decision and uh, and I think that for um, for the you know the provincial government in defense of their law are saying. Uh, look, city council was dysfunctional. And by having uh, fewer councillors, this allows people to get down to business, you know. Um, now, there was all sorts of stuff when this, you know, if you just look, if you Google the 2018 uh, local, uh, you know, Better Local Government Act, where people are talking about the fact that the, the premier uh, had himself been a city councillor. Um, whose who's, uh, appreciation uh, for the deliberations of that, uh, of that esteemed body were, you know, reflected in his uh, attendance record, right? Um, and so when one of the things in the actual judgment of, of Justice Belobaba, at first instance, was that it would appear that the, there was a certain amount of peak with which the government was acting, because it wasn't clear, like, why, why do this? Why do this now? But there's another law too that they've, in part of the uh, legislation uh, to address the effects of COVID on cities is they have tried to make it, or will be making it uniform that no city can adopt a, a ranked ballot, right? So a number of municipalities have, have adopted ranked ballots, the idea of to enhancing proportional representation, but the government's view uh, is that, no, it would just be better if everyone you know, if it was the same, uh, and for consistency. And likewise, the, the primary argument, or uh, one of the arguments for the Better Local Government Act's uh, splitting of the number of wards as well, look, this is what the federal electoral districts are, so uh, let's ensure that the cities are the same, even though, as you point out, we're talking municipal government and local issues, and so presumably you would want to have uh, fewer people being represented. And then there's also questions too, and this is where, you know, it gets tricky as well, because, you know, some, some scholars would say, well, you know, courts need to uh, keep an eye on governments when it comes to redrawing electoral boundaries, because if it's, if it's clear that in interfering with electoral boundaries or an electoral process that it's very obvious that they're engaging in partisan self-dealing, well, then there needs to be a constitutional check on that. Um, it's more it's more difficult when the change seems to just kind of reflect a, an overall uh, perspective or um, you know ideology of of the of the party in power and and you know the 
the fact that this is not an isolated case in terms of, of you know, you have these other kinds of, of pieces of legislations being passed that uh, address or that undermine uh, local uh, democratic decision making. But then you also have a whole bunch of other pieces of legislation, as I said earlier, uh, that don't have to do with democratic rights, but have to do with, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, Canada or rather Ontario, the people who are, 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 are living on the lowest income uh, in the province have either through government acts or omission not seen their material circumstances change and in many cases get, get worse. And, and yet we don't seem to be able to mobilize, mobilize the same amount of, uh, of energy and, uh, and, um, and interest in, uh, in, in, addressing, in addressing that uh, in the same way that, uh, that we have this. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for that detailed answer. Um, other questions that are not Natalie's. No offense to Natalie, of course. But if there's somebody else that wants to. All right, Jen, please take it away. Jen, we can't hear you. Uh, I was muted. This is a classic Zoom problem. You can hear me now? All right, I just uh, thanked you so we can skip over that part. Uh, I said great things. Um, I was uh, wondering whether I can uh, probe probably the, um, maybe one of the reasons you started this uh, paper, there's a kind of key implication to uh, the decision sort of irrespective of its legal reasoning, like all the op-eds about uh, this case had to do with this threat of the notwithstanding clause. Uh, and the clause will ensure sort of parliamentary or legislative supremacy. It's this tool that would enable governments to say that they have the final say, but it's like a wildly controversial tool that's so infrequently used that whenever politicians threaten to use it, we start worrying in legal scholarship about the potential of a constitutional crisis. Uh, and we're in a timeline where we didn't have to see it invoked, right? So Ford didn't have to use the notwithstanding clause. We weren't pushed to that limit. Uh, I guess I'm wondering, does that mean that like maybe we learned the wrong lesson? We were saved by the courts from sort of the, the bigger sort of political implication to uh, a decision where the courts intervene and then the government asserts its supremacy. Do you think that I don't know, there's now this still existing provision that haunts legal and political fights uh, that we haven't sort of answered questions around yet? Well, I think the, um, you know, if we go back to the notwithstanding clause, there are a number of commentators who say, that, as I mentioned, you know, the government of Ontario has never used it. Um, and uh, the government of Quebec has, and recently the government of Saskatchewan did, um, and that this is evidence that you know it's a it's a, a a kind of tool of last resort, right? Like in you know you got to break the glass before you take it out, kind of thing. And uh, and and what's funny is that when you go back to the early 1980s, like we associate skepticism towards the Charter uh, of Rights and Freedoms as as something purely on the right end of the political spectrum. But a lot of vocal opponents and critics of the charter were more on the left end of the political spectrum because they were precisely concerned with what a group of unelected judges who, you know, all well-heeled and well-educated with, you know, stocks and bonds would be making decisions that affect all Canadians as opposed to democratically elected legislatures. And what kind of effect would this have on the vitality of our democracy to cede this kind of power? To these appointees of the government. And so I think that there are still, uh, you know, nowadays, uh, although, you know, the, the, there seems to be a kind of reflexive association with critiques of the charter, uh, with the political right, and with invocation of the notwithstanding clauses necessarily, you know, being something that um, populists or uh, majoritarians invoke not understanding that we live in a, a constitutional democracy and that democracy requires respect for individual rights and the judges are the best way to guarantee that. Um, but I mean, I guess what I've been trying to show in this presentation is, is that 
that's not necessarily so. And I think that I think that the fact that the notwithstanding clause was necessary in order to have the charter have the constitution patriated in the first place and have the charter uh, adopted um, that that if anything that um, since courts are are not able to perform all the governance tasks we need to meet then there necessarily has to be circumstances where courts acknowledge their own limitations because if if courts have you know an, an interesting example of this is in 2014 there was this senate secession reference and in the in the senate secession reference the supreme or the government of canada under stephen harper referred this question to the supreme court and said we'd like to start having elections for members of the senate and, uh, and so certain scholars say, well, this is an example of political evolution of the constitution. Why do we have an appointed Senate in, 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 the, in the 21st century? This is a chance for, for the government to, um, to, to evolve the constitution. And, and, and opponents said, what are you talking about? If you start having elections for the Senate, then you're going to radically change Canada's constitution because that will give the Senate more legitimacy. And now we've got two chambers uh, each with that kind of, of, of legitimacy. And this is, this is going to change the role of the Senate from its position of being a, a chamber of sober second thought. And what the Supreme Court of Canada did in its, in its decision is a University of Toronto Law Journal article that I was reading recently by a political scientist at McGill was talking about the way that the Supreme Court adopts this really, you know, architectural language, this metaphor of structure, and this idea that the structure of the Constitution constrains the government of of embarking on these kinds of of, of changes by political convention. That really, what they need to do is formally amend the Constitution to have this kind of change. And it, it kind of draws home that like some of these constitutional decisions and the reasoning that's elaborated for them can be because of the fact that the judges themselves maybe aren't too keen on the substantive wisdom of the policy or the law in question. But there's a problem with, I think, sometimes ruling, you know, coming up with elaborate metaphors like the structure of the Canadian constitution when, you know, constraining political conventions and constraining the ways in which we can involve the constitution, not just the courts, but, but the public and our political representatives can, can also stop us from evolving the constitution in more just ways. And, um, and so, you know, I, in, in the case of the Ford threatening to invoke the notwithstanding clause, I, I think that what was problematic was what seemed to be the lack of, of careful deliberation, right? You know, it, it's sort of like the, you know, uh, you can't, you know, really, uh, you know, I was going to use some kind of vulgar example because part of it is like even even with vulgarity, right? Like if you if you're going to swear, uh, you don't want you don't want to uh, to it's context matters, and and when you know that somebody understands the effect of what they are saying, that even when they break that rule, it has less of a of, a, of an impact than when it seems they're just doing it completely uh, without regard or understanding for that convention. Um, and so if there's an element of, of, of deliberateness involved, then there's gonna be more flexibility. And I think that one of the, one of the what I find the most compelling criticism was that, uh, you know, it just, it just seemed like, it just seemed like the government didn't care about these kinds of things. And I guess what I'm saying is that that's a real problem. That's a bigger problem than the court can solve for us. And because that pervades not just this one issue of, of these uh, changes to, uh, to the electoral structure of, of Toronto's municipal council in 2018, but this needs to give us pause for the range of issues about how we're dealing with the COVID pandemic, how we're going to go forward from that, all of these things. And, and, and you shouldn't have to know necessarily what the Supreme Court decided in Irwin Toy in 1989 about the scope of freedom of expression to be able to say that what happened in 2018 with the Better Local Government Act was a contradiction in terms. And, and I think that uh, the, the, there's a real cost associated with over-specializing and reifying our political discord discourse so that people feel like they're on the outside when when really these questions are affecting us all. And I think that um, that seeing the way 
in which things are only going to change if there is more of a more of a hunger for them to change. That that's the only way that we're we're going to see see much of a difference. That was really rich, Tom. Thank you. I'd uh, I'd follow up, but I yield to the group. Um, if we can be super zippy, I think we've got time for one more. But do you have a, a nice, short and snappy question and answer? I, I, I can be really uh, zippy. Are you um, sure? Tom, uh, th thanks. This was an excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I was thinking of uh, good old uh, Ralph Miliband and the state and capitalist society and his discussion of the judiciary, right? That basically is an arm of capitalism. Um, and yet, you know, I guess over, and then I grew up on Ralph Miliband uh, in my earlier studies, but I, I should say that when it comes to judicial activism, um, I'm all for it if I agree with the verdict. You know, I mean, I'm, <laughs> you have to be practical maybe about this. I understand your discussion uh, of, of the uh, division of powers, but maybe it just comes down to, you know, let's just get things done politically. And if this is the way it gets done, well, you know, we take it. What I think is interesting too, though, is this question of mega cities, um, which Toronto is becoming and whether or not, uh, yeah, they do now belong in a special political sphere. Um, and does it make sense for a provincial government to tell Toronto what to do anymore. And I think that's a really interesting political question that's pointing out. I don't know how, you, if you feel there's an answer to that or it's premature, I guess, but, but well, thank I you actually, for an excellent talk. I think, no, but I, I think that that, uh, I think that is the, the question. You know, I, I think that the, um, and, I, and I don't think that the Supreme Court's gonna be able to answer it. And I think, so part of my, I mean, I, I get what you're saying, I, I, absolutely. And it's funny because Mark Tushnet, who's a, an American constitutional scholar, has this concept of, of uh, what he calls constitutional hardball, right? And, you know, America has all these examples. I mean, we see it on, on CNN or Fox News. I don't know how many Fox News viewers we have here tonight for this uh, Oshawa Public Library event. But, uh, you know, constitutional hardball is where you, ignore these conventions or pretend they don't exist or they don't apply to you. Um, and the funny thing is that people who are engaged in constitutional hardball or their supporters never think of it as constitutional hardball. They're being clever. They're being sharp. They're serving, you know, their voters. And so, you know, it, it really depends on, on whether, yeah, you agree with the outcome or you're inclined to the view. And I think we need to be careful about that because I think that, you know, one of the things I've tried to underscore is, is that, you know, um, as much as, as one might, uh, uh, you know, agree with a, an outcome or, or, or want to see a, um, somebody who they think maybe has been reckless with the public trust that's been entrusted to them, you know, I think would be, uh, you know, well, wise to remember uh, another Englishman, um, Robert Bolt's play, A Man for All Seasons, where the protagonist Thomas Moore uh, is being chided for, for letting his enemies get away uh, and hide under the protection of the law. And he says, well, I'd let them have protection of the law. For, I'd give the devil protection of the law for my own safety's sake. You know, and and so I think that there is something within a constitutional order where, you know, you want to be willing to take your lumps to live to fight another day. And and I think that there, there's a there's a danger in a Supreme Court making a decision about recognition of municipalities and their constitutional authority, potentially hamstringing provinces in the name of curtailing abuses of power, but preventing them from perhaps providing the, the, the kinds of changes that ultimately would lead to a, a better, more protected uh, municipal uh, government structure. So I, I, I do think that it's, um, I, I definitely think that it's a pressing issue and not just for, not just for mega cities, right? But, but for, for municipalities uh, across the country. Um, and uh, and I, I think that we, you know, it'll be dangerous and it is dangerous for, for local democracy, for people to feel like they're losing those municipal uh, institutions, you know, whether, whether it's uh, in, in Oshawa or Kawartha Lakes or, or what have you. So anyway, I guess we are out of time, but I want to thank you all. And thank you, Peter Stude is our, the Dean of our Faculty of Social Science and, and Humanities. It's great to have you here, Peter. And thanks to my colleagues for their questions. And thank you to all of you for, for coming out. And so I'll hand over to Andrea. Yeah, I, I have nothing to add other than 
just one more thank you for everybody who joined us and your awesome questions and this great discussion. And I'm so glad we got a chance to do this. I look forward to seeing you all again at our next event in two weeks. Good night. Thanks, everyone.